Hello, everyone. This is Tom Connolly, uh, President and Chief Investment Officer of Versa Capital Management, uh, speaking with you today from our office in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to have a short little talk on uh, what we call the stealth bear market of 2022. Mostly, most all of you are probably aware there's a, a stock market decline that's, that started early this year. Uh, in some cases later last year uh, for some investments um, that has uh, extended into the second half uh, of this year. And uh, in that marketplace, uh, broad market uh, indices, both in the U.S. and abroad, are down in the neighborhood of 18 to 22 percent uh, for the year to date. But percolating under the hood there is a much more substantial decline in more speculative asset classes. And these asset classes um, started their uh, run in uh, either 2017 or during the COVID period. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we just wanted to share with you um, some of the uh, price movements in these assets and uh, t uh, because the, the environment reminds me a lot of what happened in uh, 2000 when the tech bubble started to uh, deflate and again in the uh, go-go years of the late 1960s and so let's take a look here at some of the um, what's going on under the hood in the marketplace the investments here involved are primarily what we call speculative growth assets and uh, stocks and uh, more technologically oriented companies and the crypto space. So let's proceed. Um, here, we're looking at a chart which shows the movement of uh, a particular mutual fund uh, managed by Kathy Wood called uh, ARC, the ARC uh, Investment Fund. Um, and we have uh, Tesla as well, right next to it. Tesla happens to be a rather large component in that mutual fund, or it's actually an uh, exchange-traded fund format of a mutual fund. And we have two price movements on the chart. The red uh, looks at the price movement year-to-date 2022, and the blue is the price movement from the most recent high, which is typically in either November of 1920, uh, I'm sorry, 2021, or um, uh, February of uh, the same year. And so we can see the ARC, which contains uh, an exchange traded fund that contains many of these speculative growth companies, as of June 30th, was down 50 over 57% for the year to date. Um, it's from its high uh, last year, it's down 74%. Now this was a Vanguard fund, uh, kind of a representative slice, if you will, of speculative growth companies and all kinds of different parts of the economy, which were supposed to be transformative to the way we live, produce, um, and uh, uh, interact in society. Uh, the, the major the largest holding in ARC was Tesla. Everybody's uh, familiar with that. And this is a, a representative stock in the electronic vehicles or EV space. It's down 36% year to date, 45% from its recent high. And this actually is one of the better performing investments in the EV space. If we move on a bit here and look at, well, what's happened in the stock market to uh, IPOs, um, or initial public offerings, stocks that uh, new companies, uh, or not necessarily new companies, but companies that just begin to list on the major stock exchanges, um, up and coming companies. So they are down almost 48% year to date, over 60% uh, from their uh, high. And uh, the uh, uh, exchange traded fund that focuses on what are called SPACs, um, which are companies that are blind pools that are formed up to purchase a private company in part to circumvent having to go through the process of, uh, you know, the extensive regulatory and, and uh, uh, compliance process of going through an I, 
becoming an IPO, um, they typically will invest in a in a in a, a very young, typically a, a billion or a few billion or less a private company buy it in this publicly offered vehicle called a SPAC, um, and they are uh, have declined thirty eight percent year to date and sixty percent uh, from their uh, most recent high. In the crypto space. Um, Bitcoin itself is down 57% year to date and 70% from its most recent high. And for if you've been reading about the crypto space, some of the exchanges, which kind of focus uh, on uh, holding, transacting, and lending against cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, are uh, down quite a bit more. Some are... Uh, in the process of either being bailed out, being purchased by other public companies or private companies, um, uh, or uh, basic, uh, unwinding. We even have a hedge fund that specializes in the crypto space that's just filed for bankruptcy. So the price activity in a lot of uh, uh, areas in the crypto space is even worse than this. Now, I will say this about Bitcoin. Um, which probably applies to some of the other crypto assets as well, that uh, Bitcoin has suffered through at least three episodes of declines 70% or greater since in, in the period of its existence, um, which is fairly recent, and it has come back. So the, the fact that uh, Bitcoin's down 70% right now from its most recent high is not necessarily a death sentence uh, for Bitcoin or the crypto space. Um, but however, we've, we've made our uh, uh, thoughts known on the crypto space in uh, previous videos, and I'll, I'll defer to those for, you, uh, for the, uh, our beliefs. In terms of particular companies, uh, Netflix, um, and Facebook, or the, uh, what used to be called Facebook, is now called Meta, are also down quite a bit, uh, 71, over 70% for Netflix year to date and from its high, 52% for Facebook, 57 from its high. And Facebook, uh, you know, like some of these other stocks that used to be growth or speculative growth stocks, the price declines have moved them from indices in the market that focus on growth stocks into indices that now focus on value stocks. So the price movement has been so large as to reclassify some of these from growth, in some cases speculative growth, into value stocks. Uh, that's an interesting phenomenon. Um, some of the things that you might be familiar with from work or home, uh, Peloton, the exercise bike uh, or exer I should say exercise company, down 74% year to date, almost 95% from its high. That's pretty amazing. Zoom. Um, Zoom is uh, down 40% year to date, over 80% from its high. Now, how can that possibly be? Zoom, uh, during COVID and now at post-COVID as well, has uh, become fairly dominant in the meeting space, working space, people communicating, working from home, uh, changing meetings from in-person to remote. Well, it sounds like a great and successful business model, widely adapted. Um, to me, this is uh, a great, great example of a timeless lesson that a great company is not necessarily a great stock. Uh, Zoom may be very successful, go on to be very, very profitable in the long run. But the crucial element here is it depends what you pay for it. That's really the critical, one of the critical considerations is a great idea or a great company. Um, you know, we talk about them, uh, social get togethers over the coffee table, uh, the narrative surrounding the stories surrounding these companies, but very often left out of the conversation is how much am I paying for it? Um, and that Zoom is a great current example of that. And also uh, another, another company, which maybe not as many people are familiar with, but DocuSign enables interaction uh, with electronic documents that require signatures and, and the like. So um, 
the, the these price movements range from down 40 percent to over 90 as we've seen and i mentioned before that this looks a lot like reminds me a lot of 2000 after the tech bubble uh went away and um started to deflate and so i want to talk a little bit about that uh here is a report from the gilder uh, the gilder technology report in the fall of 1999 i was a subscriber uh back then to this and um uh, in 1990, the fall of 1999, you know, less than six months before the uh, tech bubble started to go into reverse, these were in uh, the Gilder report, nine companies poised to change the world. Uh, Global Crossing, Nortel, the big Canadian telecom company, Qualcomm still around, Broadcom has, was around till recently, it got purchased, JDS Uniface, Texas Instruments, some of you may know or remember these names. Um, they were uh, some of the vanguard companies of the uh, dot-com era. And I wanted to show you kind of what happened to them afterwards. Um, I'm not going to read these off, but you can see that um, through the lows of 2001, 2002, um, most of these were down, uh, if not 90, in excess of 90%, very close to it, and ultimately... Uh, went away. Um, that's not unusual in a in a tech bubble. Uh, we saw the same thing happen in the go go years in the late sixties and in the nineteen twenties when RCA led the charge with radio. We saw much of the same phenomenon. Um, and it, this is there are two lessons here: the extent to which these declines can ultimately happen. Uh, the magnitude of the losses re uh, reflect the um, extent to which the bubble happened before the fact. And the other is that uh, some very knowledgeable people who have a lot of media exposure aren't necessarily the ones you want to be relying on. So to the, one more thing on this slide. To date, uh, some of the declines I showed you, there, were, there was one that was 90, in excess of 90 uh, from the high, a lot worse in the vicinity of 70, 60. Um, so this might not be over yet. There may be a, a, a little bit further way to go in the speculative growth assets. I don't know. But um, uh, just because they're down a lot doesn't mean we, anybody should be piling in yet. So going back to more recent times, this was um, a slide that we picked up on October 19th of 2020. Uh, from Kramer showing his Magnificent Seven, um, some companies that are representative of uh, this boom. And then we have the uh, June 30th uh, price returns. He got one right, Tesla, despite the declines that I showed you uh, in the, one of the previous slides with Tesla stock, if you had held it since October 19th of 2020, it'd still be up 56%. But the other players are all down in excess of 60%, Peloton in excess of 90. And so um, if uh, you're relying on people in the media, even the even that focus in the stock market or in the financial area, you really have to be careful with who you're listening to. And this is a story that repeats again, again, and again um, uh, throughout the ages. So why is why did this happen? Uh, well, in response to the COVID downturn, uh, we had very massive, uh, in absolute and relative to history terms, uh, monetary intervention and fiscal uh, spending to help support the economy during COVID. And the pattern kind of looks like this. This would be the light blue line. And this is just in terms of the monetary aspect. Um, but if anything, the fiscal looks even more out of place. But you can see early in 2020, there was massive monetary stimulus, fiscal stimulus as well, um, that went on to help support the economy. And then um, the FANG index, the dark blue line, is uh, a combination of uh, what's now called Meta, um, Netflix, uh, Alphabet, uh, which is Google, um, the, the leading the, basically the leading stocks of the technology boom. 
Um, you can see they started to run up here in around 2016 through 2018, were flat for a little bit. And then right before COVID uh, started another run up. And it coincides with this monetary and fiscal stimulus. You see this pattern for every one of the companies and indices I just went over. It, it is coincident with the stimulus. Um, and here is one, uh, if we pan out over time a little bit. So here we're going back over the past five years and looking at Bitcoin. Um, you can see the extent of this price action, uh, which coincides with COVID. You, we really had a run up even before COVID. In fact, if you'd been holding Bitcoin, uh, were a holder over the entire five year period, you'd still be up a thousand percent despite the big price decline. So the recent price decline is from this high, recent high here, but you'd still be way up over the start five years ago. Now, typically, uh, well, first of all, the, the pattern, again, reflects is, is the most recent price run up coincides with all the monetary and fiscal stimulus. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show is that uh, year, a few years back, Grant, uh, GMO, Grantham, Mayo, Von Otterloo, uh, an investment firm did a study of past, what they classified as past bubbles that all showed this kind of hump pattern. And uh, the bubbles they showed all deflated. They all, And the, the, what that deflation looked like is they gave back all of their hump gains, if you will. So if we use that logic that we're in the deflationary period of, of a bubble with crypto and, and speculative growth assets, it could have a ways further to go. You know, here, um, and, and the question you'd ask with Bitcoin is, uh, does it give back the gains since COVID or since back in 2017? And that's a question I can't answer. Um, but there still is potentially, relative to what's happened historically with the with bubbles, a, a long way to go on the downside. I just wanted to make that point. The last thing I wanted to talk about is when you read about gains and losses in the newspaper, that you have to be careful when you talk when you're looking at gains um, in in uh, mar subsequent market recoveries versus losses because of the, of the arithmetic. So if um, what I'm trying to show here in a, is a, for a given amount of a drawdown, um, what are we looking at in terms of a recovery? How much do I need to get back to even? Uh, so here, if we focus on a 30% drawdown, so we go from $100 to $70, if I read in the, do I need a 30% recovery to get back to normal? Well, no, actually, because if I get a 30% recovery on $70, so I've gone from 100 to 70 because of the 30% decline, a 30% recovery on $70 only brings me back to $91. So I actually need a bigger recovery. Now, some of these assets we're looking at are down 60, 70, 80, 90%. So if, I, if we look at 80% decline um, and I get a subsequent recovery of 80%, I'm still behind the eight ball 60 by 64%. I still only have $46. So if I go, in other words, if an 80% decline would take me from 100 down to 20 and an 80% gain on 20 would only take me back up to $36. I, you know, I actually need um, a 400% recovery, 400% return to get me back to even. So these are the uh, items I wanted to leave you with, um, some of the thoughts on the, on the bear market and what it looks like. Um, in closing, I wanted to repeat that the idea that a um, good investment doesn't necessarily equal a good company. It depends what you pay for it. The other thing is we've talked a little bit about the stealth bear market. Uh, and I talked a little bit about bubbles and how they might typically proceed even further from where we are now on the downside. But we don't know that. Uh, markets could already be in a recovery. They could recover 
Uh, we're not making a prediction. We really are not sure because all of this is really um, speculative based on short-term price movements largely anchored uh, by emotion, and they can uh, go in lots of different directions. But to me, the current environment feels more like uh, it did in 2000 uh, during the break in the tech bubble in the go-go years. I wasn't around during the um, uh, 1920s for that one. Uh, also, I wanted to point out that our portfolios have did not uh, invest in the crypto space and do not intend to, uh, at least at this point, and that our portfolios actually were, our invest, client investments are actually tilted away from the growth stocks that were uh, exhibiting the uh, price declines that you saw. We made it part of our strategy to stay away from that because in our view, the pricing considerations were out of control, even before COVID, frankly. Um, and when prices move around unanchored to valuations, uh, it's you, you move from the realm of investing to the realm of speculation. And that's not what we do. We do investments here. And so uh, with, with respect with crypto, I mentioned that there's already been three declines. We don't quite know where that's going to go. Um, uh, you're reading a lot about how the crypto exchanges uh, and um, some of the stable coins are blow literally blowing up, disappearing. Um, if one were to invest in the crypto space, the next generation of, uh, of uh, uh, infrastructure, crypto infrastructure stocks may be a lot more interesting and there may be more regulation. It may be something to look into for some people, but at this point in time, we don't intend to uh, take a position. And lastly, the point I'd like to make is sometimes in an investment portfolio or choosing investments is as important uh, to consider what not to do as what it what to do. So, you know, most of us focus on what investments are we going to make? What actions are we going to take? Uh, left out of that consideration very often is what it is you decide not to do or don't do because that's hidden. It's not readily visible in the investment reports with first order thinking or observation. But choosing not to play in a speculative market is an important decision in and of itself, although it was painful for us um, uh, for the years running up to 2022 as some of these speculative markets took off um, and we chose not to uh, play in them. So thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to talking with you uh, on our next video, which will be coming up shortly. Have a good day.